Hi, this is Peter Taiti and Manos Brilakis from the Minneapolis Heart Institute presenting Case 17 for the Manual of Non-CTO Coronary Interventions. This is a case uh, of a patient with multivessel disease with multiple levels of complexity, specifically treatment of bifurcation as well as calcified lesions. The patient was an elderly man without previous history of coronary revascularization who presented with unstable angina. Of note, he did have a history of hemophilia type B. However, he did not require injection of recombinant factor 9. Coronary angiography demonstrated three vessel disease with significant disease into the first obtuse marginal as well as the LAD diagonal bifurcation. There was severe disease in a large and calcified right coronary artery with um, eccentric lesions in both the proximal to mid and the distal segment. At this point, the patient was taken off the table and was seen by cardiac surgery. However, he declined coronary bypass graft surgery despite his hemophilia, which might be an argument for going for surgery and hence requiring less antiplatelet therapy. However, as mentioned before, he had mild hemophilia and he did not require injections of recombinant factor 9. As a result, he was sent to us for percutaneous coronary intervention. We decided to start with recanalization of the LAD. This was a 1-1-1 bifurcation with a decent sized diagonal branch, although the ostium did not appear to be extremely diseased. And this is one way to think about how to treat bifurcations. The first question is whether the side branch is large enough or important enough to require preservation. If yes, then is it likely to occlude when the main branch is standard? And if this is the case, then a plan to stress strategy is used. Otherwise, provisional strategy is done. In this particular case, we thought that the chance of occlusion of that diagonal branch, which was of decent size, was low. Therefore, we decided to do provisional standing. However, having a guide wire in the diagonal in case that flow into it became compromised after standing of the LAD. We went ahead and placed a stent jailing the diagonal branch. That caused the pinching of the ostium. We rewired the diagonal branch with another guide wire and then did the kissing balloon inflation. And that provided a nice result with Timothy flow in both the LAD as well as the first diagonal branch. Sometimes if there's concern that the side branch is compromised, one option is to do a fractional flow reserve afterwards to determine the hemodynamic significance of any significant or any residual lesion in the ostium of the side branch. But in this particular case, this was considered a good result and we therefore turned our attention to the right coronary artery. There were many levels of complexity here. One, severe calcification. Second, tight bands and significant tortuosity. Third, the guide engagement was not perfect. And when we're treating such uh, severely calcified lesions, it's good to go in a stepwise manner. The first question is whether the PCI is the best option for this patient. As we discussed, initially bypass was recommended based on the three vessel disease and the multiple complex lesions. However, the patient had declined coronary bypass. The second question is how to do PCI in the best way. And lesion preparation is key followed by stent optimization and using of intravascular imaging liberally to ensure that the stents are optimized and the lesion is well prepared. And finally, by sometimes giving long-term dual antiplatelet therapy. In this particular case, wire went, but the balloon would not cross. And for such lesions, which are called balloon uncrossable, it is important to have an algorithm. The initial step is a small balloon, grenadoplasty, then getting extra support, for example, with a guide catheter extension or anchor technique, and trying different microcatheters or other wire cutting or wire puncture techniques. As a third line, using laser, which does not require change of the wire or atherectomy. And as a fourth line, doing subintimal modification techniques. In this particular case, the main thing seemed to be support. So by injecting, by inserting an eight friends guideline, we were able to cross 
into the distal RCA and predilate the lesion. However, that lesion also ended up being balloon undilatable, which is a very common combination with the balloon and crossable lesions. This is an approach to uh, balloon dilatable lesions. It all depends if they are de novo or within a stand. The main difference being that a therectomy is um, much um, better for de novo lesions and only rotational can be done as a last resort for in stand restenotic lesions. In this particular case, the first question is whether the lesion is suitable for a therectomy. If it is, then we typically would proceed with orbital or rotational therectomy. If it fails, or if it's not suitable for a therectomy, then we would try hypersub balloon inflations using body wires, angiosculpt, or other scoring balloons, laser, and subindimal lesion crossing, but crossing over to a therectomy if any of those strategies were to fail. In this particular case, we decided to do a therectomy and we used a 1.75 pair given the very large size of the vessel over a rotafloppy guide wire. After rotablation, there is some improvement in the stenosis at both the proximal and the distal segment. But we had still significant difficulty delivering equipment and during the process we lost guide caster position and wire position. We therefore changed the guy catheter into a hockey stick, then rewired the lesion, and then we decided to try to use uh, the body wire for balloon delivery. You can see there are two wires into the vessel, but that was unsuccessful. We therefore went into the technique that we found very useful for such complex lesions, which is the distal anchoring. A balloon is inserted over the second guide wire, essentially anchoring the first wire against the wall of the vessel. And by doing that, we were able to deliver a fairly long 38 millimeter stand in the mid to distal right coronary artery that was successfully delivered. And then we used the anchoring balloon again to deliver a stand more proximally. And after doing that and going with high pressure inflations, we were able to expand the lesion it is not a perfect expansion, however, by intravascular ultrasound, there was a very large lumen area. Therefore, we decided to not attempt additional high pressure post dilatation. Several potential lessons from this case. The first one is that for bifurcations, the simplest technique is that is being used, the better it is, except for lesions that are true bifurcations with involvement of the side branch provisional strategy seems to be the best in terms of long-term outcomes. One would still, however, jail a wire into the side branch to ensure access into the vessel in case it becomes compromised during stenting. The second is when treating severely calcified lesions, achieving good vessel preparation is critical for being able to deliver stents and being able to expand them well. This is the atherectomy regret or rotor regret. It's important to treat the lesion properly so that there is uh, less chance of poor outcomes due to poor preparation. Despite preparation, sometimes delivery can be challenging in highly calcified tortuous vessel, and using the distal anchoring technique can be very useful. And finally, intravascular ultrasound or optical coherence tomography is important in heavily calcified lesions to ensure that the lesion is well expanded and the stent is well expanded minimizing the risk for stent thrombosis and restenosis. Thank you.